All right, Karina baby, good morning. Today is the 27th. You are five years, five months, and 17 days old today. Mama can't believe it. You're getting so big, and I missed you so incredibly much, baby. All right, so for today, the 22nd, it is a secret place. I know a secret hiding place down by the apple tree, and if you promise not to tell, I'll take you there with me. It was a log where we can, oh, it has a log where we can sit, a mossy table too, and a leafy sort of window where the sun comes shining through. No one in the whole world could ever find us there, so now you know about it, it's a secret we can share. Oh, she brought her teddy bear to her hideout. In life, baby, it's always good to have a place that you like to go that is all your own. Even if that place is only in your mind's eye. If you're laying on your bed and you're just thinking about your happy place of where you want to be in that moment. Whether it's by a lake, by the ocean, in the mountains, at... You know, looking at the northern lights for pretend. I know that we have the northern lights for you at the house that you just switch on, too. So you can have the stars and the moon and the rainbow and the northern lights, hopefully, still. I don't know if that stuff is still there. But Mama wanted you to have that just experience. And your grandmother was so indulgent of me wanting you to have that. And she got you all that stuff. And Mama and Papa... I should have been able to lay down and enjoy it together with you, but, um, it's going to be okay. All right. So from our next storybook, it is the ugly duckling. It was so lovely in the country. It was summer. The wheat was yellow. The oat was green. The hay was sticking in the meadows. No, the hay was stacked in the meadows. And the stork went tiptoeing about on his red legs, jabbering Egyptian, a language his mother had taught him. Around the fields and meadows were great forests, and in the midst of those forests lay deep lakes. Yes, it was indeed lovely in the country, and an old manor house stood there, bathed in sunshine, surrounded by a deep moat, and from the walls down to the water's edge, the bank was covered with great wild rhubarb leaves, which were growing so high that the little chicken could have been able to stand upright. Oh, <laughs> I'm so used to reading you farm books. Uh, rhubarb leaves, which were growing so high that the little children would have been able to stand upright under the biggest of them. The place was as much of a wilderness as the densest forest. There sat a duck on her nest, busy hatching her ducklings. But she was almost tired of it because sitting in such a tedious, because sitting is such a tedious business and she had very few collars. The other ducks thought it more fun to swim about in the moat than to come and have a gossip with her under the wild rhubarb leaf. At last, one eggshell after another began to crack. Open, chip, 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 chip. All the yolks had come to life and were sticking out their heads. Quack, quack, said the duck, and her little ducklings came, scrambling as fast as they could, looking about under the green leaves, and their mother let them look as much as they liked, because green is so good for the eyes. How big the world is, said the ducklings, for they felt far more comfortable now than they were lying in their eggs do you imagine this is the world is the whole of the world asked their mother 
It goes far beyond the other side of the green, right into the rec the rector's field. But I've never been there yet. I hope you're all here. She went on, and he and hoisted herself up. Nope, I haven't got every one of you even now. The biggest egg is still there. I wonder how much longer it will take. I'm getting rather bored with the whole thing. And she squatted down again on the nest. Well, how are you getting on? Asked Old Duck. Who came to call on her? That the last egg is taking an awfully long time, said the mother duck. It won't break, but let me show you the others. They're the sweetest ducklings I've ever seen. They are all exactly like their father, the scrap. He never came to see me. Let me look at the egg that won't break, said the old duck. You may be sure you may be sure it's a turkey's egg. I am fooled. I was fooled like that once. And the t the terrible and bother I had with those youngsters because they were actually afraid of the water. I simply could not get them to go in. I quacked at them and I snapped at them, but it was no use. Let me see the egg of 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 course. It's a turkey's egg, leave it alone, and teach the other children to swim. Oh, well, if I've taken so much trouble, I must just as well sit a little longer, said Mother Duck. Please yourself, said the old duck, and she waddled off. At last, the big egg cracked. Cheep, cheep, said the youngest, scrambling out. He was so big, and he was not so handsome. Mother Duck looked at him. What a frightfully big duckling that one is, she said. None of the others looked like that. I wonder if he could possibly be a turkey chick. Well, we'll soon find out. He'll have to go into the water even if I have to kick him in myself. I don't think turkeys can swim. So Mama Duck is like, that's a turkey egg, a turkey, turkey duckling. I'm going to kick that little duckling because it's not a duckling, it's a turkey into the water myself, right? What would happen when it swim? The next day, the weather was simply glorious. Mother Duck appeared with her family down by the moat splash. There was, there, there she was in the water. Quack, quack, she said, and one duckling after another plunged in. The water closed over their heads, but they were up again in a second and floated beautifully. All of them were out in the water now, even the one that was not so pretty and a gray creature was swimming along with them. That's no turkey, she said. Look how nicely he uses his legs and how straight he holds himself. He isn't really so bad when you take a good look at him. Quack, quack! Come along with me. I'll bring you out into the world and introduce you to the duckyard, but keep close to me or you may get stepped on and look out for the cat. So they made their entrance into the duckyard. What a phenomenon this was. Two families were quarreling over the eel's head, but in the end, the cat got it after all. There you are, that's the way of the world, said Mother Duck, mm -hmm. licking her lips, for she did so want the eel's head herself. Now use your legs, she said, move about briskly and bow to the old duck over there. She is the most... Our... Our is... A-R-I-S-T-O-C-R-A-T-I-C. Aristotic. Aristotic person here. 
and of old Spanish blood. That's why she is a scout. And be sure to observe the red rag around her leg. It's a great distinction and the highest honor that can be bestowed upon a duck. It means that her owner wishes to keep her and that she is, so, is to be specially noticed by men and beasts. Now hurry. Don't turn your toes in and well brought up ducklings Turn your toes out, just as his father and mother do, like that. And they did as they were told, but the other ducks looked at them and said out loud, There now have we got to have this crowd too, as if there wasn't enough of us already. Ugh, what a dreadful looking creature that duckling is we won't put up with him and immediately a duck rushed at him and bit him on the neck leave him alone said the mother he's not bothering any of you i know said the duck who had bitten him but he's too big and funny looking what he wants is a good smacking those are pretty children you've got mother said the old duck with the rag around her leg. They are all nice looking except that one. But don't turn, he didn't turn out so well. Your grace, said Mother Duck, he's not handsome, but he is as good as gold and he swims as well as any of the others. I dare say even a little better. He was in the egg too long. That's why he isn't particularly shaped. And she pecked his neck and brustled up his little creature. As it happened, he's a drake, she added. Oh my gosh, what happened to my thing? Oh, okay. So that mama duck is protecting her baby. She's like, nope, he's a drake, right? She added, so it doesn't matter quite so much. But the poor duckling, who was the last to be hatched, and who looked so not so handsome, was bitten and buffed about, and made fun of by all the other ducks, as well as the hens. He's too big, they all said. And the turkey cock, who was born with spurs, and consistently thought he was an emperor, blew himself up like a ship in full sail and made for him gobbling and and gabbling till his waddlers were quite purple the poor duckling did not know where to turn he was so miserable because of his not so handsomeness and because he was the butt of the whole of the whole barnyard so everyone was making fun of him right that's not nice and so it went on all, all first, all the first day. And after that, matters grew worse and worse. His own brothers and sisters were downright nasty to him and always said, I hope the cat gets you, you skinny bag of bones. And even his mother said, I wish you were miles away. And the ducks bit him and the hens pecked at him and the girl who fed them tried to kick him with her foot. So one day, half running and half flying, he scrambled over the fence. The little birds in the bushes rose up in alarm. That's because I'm not so handsome, thought the duckling, and closed his eyes, but he kept on running and finally came out into the, gr the great marsh where the wild ducks lived they had there he laid the whole night long very tired and very sad in the morning the wild ducks flew up and looked at their new companion what sort of fellow are you they asked and the duckling turned in all directions bowing to everybody around him as nicely as he could you're a 
You're appealingly not so handsome, said the wild ducks. But why would we care so long as you don't marry into our family? Poor thing, as if he had any thought of marrying. All he wanted to do was to lie amongst the reeds and drink a little of the marsh water. So he lay there for two whole days and then came two wild geese, or rather ganders, for they were young males. They had not been out of their eggs very long, and that was why they were so cocky. Listen, young fellow, they said, you're so not so handsome that we actually like you. Will you join us and be a bird of passage? There are so there are some lovely wild geese, all nice young girls in the marsh nearby. You're not so handsome that you might appeal to them. You're so not so handsome that you might appeal to them. Two shouts rang out. Two shots rang out. Bang, bang. Both ganders fell dead amongst the reeds, and the water was reddened with their blood. Bang, bang was heard again, and a large flock of geese flew up from the reeds. Then bang, 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 again and again, a great hunt was going on. The men were lying under cover around the marsh, and soon some of them were even up in the trees. Blue smoke drifted in amongst the dark trees and was carried far out over the water. Though the mud came, the gun dogs splash, splash, sniffing through the reeds and, and rushes. The poor duckling was scared out of his wits and tried to hide his head under his wing. When suddenly, a fierce looking dog came close to him, his tongue hanging from out of his mouth and his wild eyes glaring hungry, horribly, gleaming horribly. He opened his jaw wide, showed his sharp teeth and splash, splash, off he went without touching the duckling. Thank heavens, he sighed. I'm so not handsome that even the dog won't bother to bite me. And so he lay particularly still while the shots rifled through the reeds and the gun after gun was fired. It was toward evening when it was quiet again. Even then the poor duckling dared not stir. He waited several hours before he looked around him and then hurried away from the march as fast as he could. He ran over the fields and the meadows. hardly able to fight against the strong wind. Late that night, he reached a wretched little hut, so wretched, in fact, that it did not know which way to, to fall, and that is why it remained standing upright. The wind whistled so fiercely around the duckling that the poor thing simply had to sit down on his tail to keep it from being knocked over. The storm grew worse and worse. Then he noticed that the door had come off of its hinges and hung so crookedly that he could slip inside through the opening. And that is what he did. An old woman lived there with her tomcat and her hen. The cat, whom she called Sonny, knew how to arch his back and purr. In fact, he could even give out sparks. But for that, she had to rub his fur the wrong way. The hen had little short legs and was called Stumpy. She produced many, many eggs, and the old woman loved her as her own child. The next morning, they at once noticed the strange duckling. The cat began to purr and the hen to cluck. What's the matter? asked the old woman, looking all about her. But her eyes were not very good, and she missed up the duckling for a fat duck 
that had lost her way. What a windfall, she said. Now I shall have duck eggs. If it doesn't happen to be a drake, we must make sure of that. So the duckling was taken into the house on trial for three weeks, but not a single egg came along. Now the cat was master of the house and the hen was mistress. And they always said, we and the world. For they imagine themselves to be not only half the world, but by far the better half. The, duck, the duckling thought the other people might be allowed to have an opinion too, but the hen could not see that at all. Can you lay eggs? she asked. No. Well then, you'd better keep your mouth shut. And the cat said, can you arch your back and purr and, and give out sparks? No. Well, then, you can't have any opinion worth offering when sensible people are speaking. The duckling sat in a corner, feeling very gloomy and depressed. Then he suddenly thought of the fresh air and the bright sunshine, and such a longing came over him to swim in the water that he could not help telling the hen about it. What's the matter with you, asked the hen. Those silly ideas, either lay eggs or purr, and you'd soon be all right. You don't understand me, said the duckling. Well, if we don't understand you, then who could? You surely don't imagine you're wiser than the cat or the old woman, not to mention myself. Of course, don't give yourself such airs, child. Believe me, I only wish you well. I tell you on pleasant things, but that's the way to no one's real friends. Come on, hurry up. See that you lay eggs and do learn how to purr or to give out sparks. I think I had better go out into the wide world, said the duckling. Please yourself, said the hen. So the duckling went away. He walked on the land and swam in the water and dived down into it. But he was still snubbed by every creature because of his not so handsomeness. Autumn set in, the leaves turned yellow and brown. The wind caught them and whirled them about and up in the air it looked very cold. The clouds hung low, heavy, with snowflakes, and the fence perched, and on the fence perched the raven, trembling with cold and crowing. Caw! Caw! The mare thought of it was enough to make everybody shiver. The mere thought of it was enough to make everybody shiver. The poor duckling was continually to be pitted. One evening when the sun was sitting in all its splendor, a large flock of big handsome birds came out of the bushes. The duckling had never before seen anything quite so beautiful as they were dazzling white and long supple necks. They were swans. They uttered the most uncanny cry and spread their splendid great wings to fly away to warmer countries and open lakes. They rose so high, so very high in the air that a strange feeling came over the ugly little duckling. As he watched them, he turned around and around in the waves like a wheel, craning his neck to follow the flight and uttered a cry so loud and strange that it frightened him. He could not forget those nimble birds, those happy birds, and when they were lost in sight, he dived down to the bottom of the water. Then when he came up again, he was quite beside himself. He did not know what the birds were called, nor where they were flying to, and yet he loved them more than he had ever loved anything. He did not envy them in the least. It would never occur to him to want such beauty for himself. He 
would have been quite content if only the ducks would have put up with him, the poor, not so handsome creature. And the winter grew so cold, so bitterly cold, the duckling was forced to swim about to keep the water. Look at him, the nice old lady. From freezing all together, but every night the opening became smaller and smaller. At last it froze so hard that the ice made cracking noises and the duckling had to keep on paddling to prevent the opening from closing up. In the end, he was exhausted and lay quite still, caught in the ice. Early the next morning, a farmer came by, and when he saw him, he went into the ice, broke it with his wooden shoe, and carried him home to his wife. There, that, there the, duckling, the duckling revived. The children wanted to play with him, but he thought they might to do him harm. So he fluttered terrified into the milk pail, splashing the milk all over the room. The farmer's wife screamed and threw up her hands in fright. Then he flew into the butter tub, and from that into the flour pail, and out again. What a sight he was! The woman squeaked and struck at him with her tongs. Laughing and shouting, the children fell on each other trying to catch him. Fortunately, the door was open, so the duckling dashed out of the house and into the bushes and lay there in a daze in the newly fallen snow. It would be too sad, however, to tell of the terrible and misery he had to suffer during that cruel winter. But when the sun began to shine warmly, he found himself once more in the marsh among the reeds. The larks were singing, in the, it was spring, beautiful spring. Then suddenly he sprang, he spread his wings. The sound of their whirling made him realize how much stronger they have grown. And they carried him powerfully, powerfully along. Before he knew it, he found himself in a great garden where the apple tree stood in bloom and the lilacs filled the air with its fragrance. It was so lovely here, so full of the freshness of spring, and fluttering down the stream in front of him came three beautiful white swan swans, ruffling their feathers proudly. The duckling recognized the glorious creatures and felt a strange sadness come over him. I will fly near those royal birds, and they will peck me to death for daring to bring my ugly self near them. But that didn't matter in the least. Better to be killed by them than to be beaten, bitten by the, by the ducks, pecked by the hens, kicked by the girl in charge of the hen, run, and suffer untold agony in winter. Then he flew into the water and swam towards the beautiful swans. They saw him and dashed at him with over with with outspread rustled feathers kill me said the poor creature and he bowed his head down upon the surface of the stream expecting the worst but what was this he saw mirrored in the clear water he saw beneath him his own image but it was no longer the image of the awkward dirty gray bird ugly and repulsive he himself was a swan it doesn't it does not matter if one was born in a duckyard if only one has lain in a swan's egg the great swan swam around him and stroked him with their beaks he felt quite glad to have been through so much trouble and adversity for now he could finally appreciate not only his own good fortune, but also the beauty that greeted him. Some little children come into this garden to throw bread and corn into the water, and the youngest explained 
there's a new one. And the other children chimed in, yes, there's a new one. They clapped their hands, danced about, and ran to fetch their father and mother. Bread and cake were thrown into the water, and everyone said, the new one is the most beautiful. He's so young and so handsome. And the old swan bowed to him. That made him feel quite embarrassed, and he put his head under his wing, not knowing what it was was all about and on an overwhelming happiness filled him and yet he was not a bit proud for a good heart never becomes proud he remembered how once he was he had been despaired and persecuted and now he heard everyone saying that he was the most beautiful of birds most beautiful of beautiful himself and the lilac bushes dipped their branches into the water before him, and the sun shone warm and mild. He rustled his feathers and held his graceful neck high, and from the depths of his heart he enjoyed he joyfully explained, I never dreamt that so much happiness was possible when I was the not so handsome duckling. Baby, sometimes in life, you have to get through a lot of things to get to where you're meant to be, right? Life is hard. No matter how you put it, life is always going to be hard. But it's a journey, right, that we all take, and it's an individual journey. You can't, like, I know Papa's biggest fears. One of his biggest fears is uh, just being alone. He's afraid that he's going to push everyone away from him because of the way that he acts sometimes and the way that he is sometimes that's but that's his biggest fear uh, besides from custody court and stuff like that and going to counseling with mama his biggest fear is being alone right my biggest fear i'm afraid of the dark i'm afraid to live alone i don't work outside the home um so like our fears collectively play on each other all right because papa can control mama because I'm easy to control because I want him to work outside the home. Um, and no matter what, I will always love your papa. He is a, you know, we've been through too much together. But just like my untold winters with your father, right? Duckling had an untold winters, an untold winter of agony and anguish that he's been through. And, um, you know, life is hard. Life is hard. Life will always be hard. But in the end, you have to let it be worth it. Because my father, you know, my father was very, very sick. He started to be sick when I was six. He came home with a teddy bear that's probably still at our house. I'm hoping to God it is. It's his, the teddy bear's name is Dottie because I used to call him Daddy. Um, you know, and he has these red trousers with these little things going over him. And, uh, but my father came home with that teddy bear when we were living in the Pew Street house. And uh, we still owned the, the Scranton house. So we owned a house in Scranton. We owned a house in Edwardsville. We owned a house down in Georgia. We owned two lots, right? But he came home to where we were living and he had this teddy bear on him. And he told me we were outside on the sidewalk. And he knelt down in front of me because I, I ran outside to greet him. Because I, I was always a papa's girl. I was always a papa's girl. And I lost my papa young. So I want you to love your papa no matter what. People make mistakes, baby. Everyone makes mistakes. And life hurts. But, um, so I ran outside to greet him, right? And uh, he came out of his car with his teddy bear. He knelt down in front of me. And he goes, baby, I'm gonna die. He's like, but when I do, you hug this. He's like, I'll always be with you. People always live on. Every time you teach someone something I've taught you, I live on through you. It's your heart and your mind that keeps people, baby. I'll always be there with you. Okay? But I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going. Because I got sick. Right? And he told me a few months later how he knew he was sick. See, my father wasn't a drug addict. My father wouldn't do drugs. My father would support other people that would, but he wouldn't do any drugs himself. And he doesn't drink. He doesn't... Like, my father smokes, and, like, 
but he's not like a hardcore, he wasn't ever a hardcore drug addict. And, um, but he went into the hospital with a headache, right? And he went in, he's like, I have a really bad headache. And he told, he always told us, you never take pain pills. You want to be able to feel that pain. You want to be able to feel it because if there's something that actually goes wrong, you want to be able to tell somebody actually what's wrong with you. And, uh, but he went in with the migraine and they tested him for everything. He couldn't figure out what was wrong. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. He died on the operating table. They brought him back and, um, then they did an AIDS test on him and they realized he had full blown AIDS. My father never really had HIV because his girlfriend, his girlfriend had full blown AIDS when he got it from her. And he used to tell us she is his light in this dark world. He had kids, he had a wife, he had, you know, he had, he had other priorities, but he loved his partner so much that he wanted to suffer the same pain with her and die with her. He drug his kids through a lot of stuff. Like I took care of my grandfather, your grandfather. I took care of my father. I would shave his face and patch up his lesions and give him back rubs and do all kinds of things, right? And this is just life. Life is just hard. And you look back on the hard parts of your life and you are blessed for every single second that you are healthy and that you are breathing, right? This life is short. It will always be short. I don't care how many years you live. I don't care if you live until 98 because your day is here. Your day is gone. Your day is here. Your day is gone. Every single second that now happens is now in the past. You can't get it back. All right. So you have to be really wise with what you want to do with your time. Don't give up your time to a corporation if that's not what you want to be doing. As a woman, mama doesn't work outside the home. And my mind doesn't let me. Like, I did, I used to, I put your papa through college. Seven years. I, wor I worked outside the home really, really hard because my, my mother, your grandmother, is a career woman. She gets satisfaction from working outside the home. You yourself, Karina, you might be a career woman. You might get that same satisfaction that your grandmother gets because it's within your gene system to work outside the home and have that title and collect that money. And you know, you might be like that and that's completely fine. You might, you wanted to be a doctor when you were younger. You still want to be a doctor. You might become a doctor one day and that's a whole doctorate degree. That's a lot of years. That's many years of college that you might want to go through in order for you to be a doctor of any kind that you want to be, right? Whether you want to be a doctor for children or be a doctor for adults or be a doctor for pets or be a doctor because we're all mammals, right? So, Whatever it is that you want to do with that doctorate that you want to do, that's completely fine. You might be a career woman like your grandmother is, and that's, I'll support you in anything you want to do. It's just that mama isn't, and mama isn't because of my, my heart and my mind and my past, all right? Our past shapes us. Our past has strings that connect us from the present to the past. Like, I know that past is gone, but we have strings that connect us inside of our mind of, what we think is good behavior and what we think isn't from our past. Like mama tends to think that nobody really cares when I'm out what I do, right? So if I'm standing in line and there's a little um, coin thing, I'll tell somebody I'm gonna take this coin for good luck. And I do, because I'm a Jew, I'm a cheap Jew. And uh, I want the coin for good luck. I only take one, but you know, it's okay. I just, and if I find change on the ground, I'm definitely picking it up. And I think you should too. Every single penny that you save adds up. And, uh, you know, it's just a good thing to do. It's good to always keep that present in your mind that, you know, even, even that penny counts, even that second counts, right? I have a, my favorite poem is Rubard Kipling, right? I'm going to read that to you because, you know, life is a journey and life is hard and there's nothing wrong with you knowing that. I'm going to look it up actually on one of my phones because I don't know. on paper, but I do have it on paper. It used to be on a refrigerator. I think I'm going to post it in my room. I have your photos right here. I think I'm going to post it next to your photos. Your photos are right here. I see you every single day. I think about you every second. If by Rudyard Kipling. This is 
Mama's favorite poem. Mama was working at UPS with a gentleman named Mr. Ford, and we would load trucks together. Um, I used to work at UPS overnight, right, because I was busy all day working and going to school. And so I needed a night job because your papa needed money and mama needed to pay the bills and mama needed to pay off student loans and before that mama didn't get student loans for the first semester so I had to pay school as I was going and uh, so it's just really hard mama worked really really hard in order to put papa through school and he has a really really good career potential he is a male and he is a male within our society women when they work I feel like women make pin money or like pocket change you know men when they work I feel like they make career money and they do very well and you know women and men just have different skill sets I'm, I was very good at taking care of you and having you and being pregnant with you and like very good at all the motherly stuff. Your papa is very good at all the fatherly stuff. He does work outside the home. He does very good. All right. So if, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two and they're imposters, they're both imposters, triumph and disaster are both imposters. You could lose everything in a second. Mama lost everything in a second more than once. And it's hard to get your life back, it really is. So if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and swoop down and build them up with worn out tools if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all in one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word of your loss if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are all gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them hold on if you can talk with crowds and keep your common virtue or walk with kings nor lose your common touch if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you if all men count with you but none too much if you can fill the unforgiving minute with fit with 60 seconds worth of a distance run yours is the earth in everything that is in it and which is more you'll be a woman my daughter it always says be a man my son because he wrote this for his son um but you have to really look at life and take it for what it is. Just like, let's do the song. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Life is short, baby. And no one ever says you have to take that boat turn it around and put it uphill, all right? You could row your boat gently down that stream of life. You don't have to make your life hard. There are so many external forces in this life now that can make it hard. People have TVs and computers and internets and um, I know it's one internet now. Your papa taught me that. I didn't know that before. <laughs> but people have so much now that are playing on them on external forces right of we should want this or should we should need that or we should get this or do that but I mean what is life though very simple life is very simple we are mammals right who women have children and men create things and build things right and we have short lives we have 60 years of a well pretty much able body right to carry out our lives with. And really, it's not even 60 years. Bodies age quickly. 
and you have to take really good care of your body. You have to eat well. You have to drink good water. You have to not destroy it. Don't don't drink. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything like that. You don't want your hair to becoming gray when you're in your 20s. All right, Mama's not in her 20s, and my hair's not gray. All right, you have good genetics. You have good genes, baby, from both sides. Your father has good genes too. He just chooses to. He, he likes to he likes to do what he likes to do. So he looks a little bit older than what he should. But you, you have that choice. This is, your body is your body. You have a choice of what you put in it and what you don't. Okay? I just, I want you to make good choices with your body. Because I know the genetics. And I know you have good genetics. I also know that you have a lot of people in our, in our family that just, they have addictive genetics. And, you know, and that's okay. It's just how you choose to curb your own behavior because behavior is curbable it's okay but um i just i just love you baby i do i just love you and i just miss you and i just i want to teach you so much like my father taught us so much so much every day all the time we were always going places always doing things he wanted us to have ex experiences so we knew what we wanted to maybe do one day you know like he just like i did with you like i want you to have the experiences i feel like if you go someplace and see it for yourself you could choose whether or not you like something like going to plays or going like museums like i just i just wanted you to have and all the library trips i took you to and all the friends I wanted you to have and all the things I wanted you to just experience and do because life is short so make it as fun as possible go to the bounce house and jump in the bounce house and you're never too old to, bu to um, jump in the bounce house mama was in the bounce house jumping with you like you know I just I want you to not grow up too fast and I just want you to just be happy and just learn everything because you are at such a good age Zero to four is the window period, and Mama tried to teach you everything within that. And all the time that I had with you uh, to try to just, you know, that's why we did Your Baby Can Read from day one. And, you know, that's why Mama just wanted to teach you everything. And I know that my past makes it, so I think everything's just going to be okay eventually, you know, because things eventually do work out. They do. And it's going to eventually be okay, baby. I'll eventually see you. We'll eventually go places. We'll eventually do things. We just have to be patient. Mama's just trying to be patient. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, talk to you a bit. I don't know. I wish I just had you. I wish I could just hold you in my arms and just talk to you. This chair wouldn't hold the both of us, though. This would, this is going to become your chair. When, um, when you get here, look at, oh my god, a little dinosaur chair. Because I like the little chairs because I fit in, in them. Because Mama's not big. Mama's only 5'1". And... I don't weigh anything, so, you know, I just, I like the little chairs because it fits in my room so well. <laughs> I don't want a big chair in my room and it's easy to move around, so, but I just, I love you, baby, and I miss you. I do. I miss you. All right, let's do some songs. Let's do, sing a song of six pence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty black birds baked in a pie. When the pie was open, the birds began to sing. Now wasn't that a dainty just a step before the king? The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen was in the parlor, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, setting out the clothes. When down came a blackbird that pecked off her nose. How about let's do... The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. The dry, the windshield wipers on the bus go swish, 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 swish. The windshield wipers on the bus go swish, 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 all through the town. The doors on the bus go open and close. Open and close, open and close. The doors on the bus go open and close all through the town. And then what do you see when you walk in? The ticket holder on the bus goes click, 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 click. The ticket holder on the bus goes click, click, click all through the town. The money on the bus goes ching, 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 ching. The money on the bus goes ching, 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 all through the town. The horn on the bus goes beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep, beep. The horn on the bus goes beep, 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 
all through the town. The bus goes stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. The bus goes stop and go all through the ba- the town. The bell on the bus goes ding, 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 ding. The bell on the bus goes ding, ding, ding all through the town. And then who do you see? You see the driver, right? The driver on the bus goes move on back, move on back, move on back. The driver on the bus goes move on back all through the town. The mamas on the bus, they say, I love you, I love you, I love you. The mamas on the bus say, I love you, all through the town. The babies on the bus go up and down, up and down, up and down. The babies on the bus go up and down, all through the town. The papas on the bus say, I love you, I love you, I love you. The papas on the bus say, I love you, all through the town. The workers on the bus, they take a nap. Take a nap, take a nap. The workers on the bus, they take a nap all through the town. The bikes go on the front of the bus, the front of the bus, the front of the bus. The bikes go on the front of the bus all through the town. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. The gentlemen on the bus, they give up their seats, give up their seats, give up their seats. The gentlemen on the bus, they give up their seats for the ladies all through the town. The ladies on the bus, they take a seat, take a seat, take a seat. The ladies on the bus, they take a seat all through the town. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. All right, let's do... Um, a tisk it, a task it, a green and yellow basket. I sent a letter to my love, and on my way I lost it. I lost it, I lost it. A little boy picked it up and put it in his pocket. A tisk it, a task it, a green and yellow basket. Alright, let's do... Uh... Let's do Lila Toe, baby. I just, I love you. And just know that life is hard. Everyone goes through a lot. Everyone does. It doesn't matter who you are. And you have to just realize this is your situation, right? Other people have their own situation. You can't be jealous of anyone else's situation. Jealousy will kill people, right? We don't want to be jealous of anything. You want to take what you have and be grateful for everything that you have. That's how mama stays content in situations, right? I think about all my blessings every single day. I am blessed to be where I'm at. I'm blessed to have a roof over my head. Even if I didn't, it would be okay, right? It's going to be okay in the end no matter what. But you have to take every single second of every single day and just be blessed for what you do have. And you have to take in your own situation because what you have isn't what somebody else has and what someone else has isn't what you have. And that's okay. You got to be okay in all things. Like say someone had a birthday party, right? And that person got a huge cake. Right? They got a huge cake with all these candles, and inside this cake there was a huge brick of gold, and they got their brick of gold and their huge cake, and they had all these guests and got all these presents, right? You went to that birthday party. What are you? You're happy for that person, right? That person did amazingly well for their birthday. And then when, say, it's your birthday, right? What do you get? Say you got a tinier cake, right? You got a cake like this, and you got a present, and only one person showed up. You are blessed, no matter what. And say you didn't even get a cake, all right? Say you got no cake. Say that you got water and you got a sandwich and that's what you got for your birthday. And say that you spent it alone by the water at a lake somewhere, all right? You are blessed, all right? Say you didn't even have a lake, all right? Say that you are sitting outside on the sidewalk by yourself just with with yourself, with your thoughts, nothing else. Say you got nothing for your birthday. My father, when we were 10... We had, because I'm a twin, so we were down at one of the houses. We were at the Pew Street house, and back then there was a porch on it, and he told us that we had to clean for the day. Um, It was our birthday, and he was getting sicker, and he wanted us to know that a day is a day, no matter what, because we are going to have birthdays along the way where no one's going to celebrate them. Everyone's going to forget them. It's going to be fine, right? So our mother called him, and wanted us to come home because she got us a cake and he didn't want us to have a cake on that day for our birthday particularly for this birthday and uh, so we are outside on the porch and we're cleaning and we spent the entire day taking rocks out of the basement 
and cleaning up the porch and just hard labor. He wanted us to just work really, really hard. He wanted us to be really, really tired at the end of the day. He wanted us to know that every day is a day, right? So we were working really hard. All of a sudden our mother calls him and he gets annoyed. And we know it's our mother because we could hear her over the phone. And uh, so we are pestering him. We're both pestering him asking, well, well, what does she want? And what is it? And blah, blah, blah. And he's like, fine, she got you a cake. You're not going home and you're not getting that cake. And we didn't. And we, we were here, right? And our mother had moved out of the house when we were eight because she, our father was very strict with certain rules and she just wanted her freedom. So, and that's completely fine. You can't trap people. And uh, they were still together, but not, you know? But, um, so he wouldn't take us home to get this cake. He didn't want us to have it. So that was completely fine. But he wanted to teach us. Like, we didn't get... A, a couple of years, our mother forgot her birthday. And she has twins, but she was working really hard. Like, she had to work outside the home because our father wasn't around after we were 12. Like, so she had to work and she had to do her stuff, right? She was a very good career woman. She was a very brilliant woman. She still is. She's a brilliant. She's brilliant. She's amazing. And, um... You know, and she was just really stressed out. But, um, yeah, but, she, like, she just wanted us to have a cake, and our father was like, no, not today. Because he won. So even if someone forgets your birthday, right, even if someone, even if you don't get anything on your birthday, you are blessed because you have your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. No one can take that away from you, okay? And you have to take in your own situation and be like, I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. Even if you're not okay in this moment, things aren't okay right now. I don't have you. I... I don't have any, like, I have a good situation, which is amazing, but I don't have you in my life right now, which is driving me crazy, but and I think every single second, every single day, this is what I'm doing instead of spending time with you, but that's my situation, and I have to continue to move forward in my situation in order to be able to get back to having you, and it's going to be okay eventually, but even if someone forgets your birthday, and you get nothing on your birthday or if someone teaches you a lesson of a day is just a day and you have to take it with strides it's going to be okay so if someone else gets three birthdays for their one birthday within the same week they get three birthdays for the one birthday in the same week if you get no one celebrating your birthday for that year it's still something you have to be content with you have to be content in all situations and just show contentment and love and caringness towards everybody around you no matter what all right i love you i love you so incredibly much let's do lila toe and good night to you lila toe may your dreams come true we sing lila toe may israel protect you throughout the night until we reach the morning lights. I sing that to you all the time. I hope you understand that you are part of Israel. You really are. And you are beholder to baby. You really are. You are a link throughout every single generation because of what your heritage just is. I love you so incredibly much. And like Papa, you always used to say, Mama's his son. Papa's my moon. You're a rainbow baby and we'll both love you no matter what. I love you, baby.